happening. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, welcome to today's uh, iForum. Uh, as usual, let me do some housekeeping. Uh, kindly use the Q&A for your questions. If you have any questions for us, later on, we will be able to also invite you to uh, speak up if you want to uh, clarify any question that you have. Again, there is also the chat room where you can do your networking. And then uh, also be reminded that you can select the language of your choice using the interpretation function, which is uh, on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, before I invite the speaker, uh, I would also like to um, you know, acknowledge those who have made this possible. We have uh, sponsors and partners, and uh, I would like to mention the SNI Sustainable Nurse Initiative, uh, GIZ Com Cashew, uh, Cashew Info, uh, Pro Cashew, and uh, Thank you for your kind support, which has made this possible. Today's topic is uh, on key dynamics, crops, and consumption in 2021. And uh, we have none other than uh, Jim Fitzpatrick. Uh, take us through. So, Jim, uh, can you hear me, Jim? Hello. So we wait for Jim's uh, mic and video to, uh, I see his screen is also starting. Hello, Jim. Good morning, Ernest. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I'm fine. And Not how about you? Not at all, thanks. Very good. OK, so please take us through today's topic on key dynamics, crops, and consumption in 2021. Uh, so we have a better grasp of what is happening with the crops and also uh, the market end of the business. Thank you, and uh, Good morning, everyone. I hope you're keeping well. It's hard to believe that it's it's a year now since this pandemic came upon us, and we've seen so many incredible events over the year, and so many strange and unexpected events in in the cashew business too. I'm going to talk about what we might call the, the key dynamics: crops and consumption. So. The key dynamics are about understanding the market, about we need to understand people's motivations, we need to understand their positions, we need to understand how they're thinking about this market at this time of year, to understand so much of the myth, so much of the misinformation, and so much of the apparently statistics, but actually things that are made up with particular objectives in mind. So to understand the market, we must understand what makes it work, and particularly what makes it react or what might make it react in the coming weeks. And this is obviously a critical time of the year. During this period, more than 20% of the world's crop is in, and 80% is just started or on the way between now and the end of June. So we'll have a look at some of the key dynamics. So we're talking, when we talk about dynamics, what makes the market work? What makes people think the way they do about the market? What makes the market react? And whether or not there's any potential for a major market reaction, the kind of things we saw in 2017, and again in 2019, one taking us to record high prices, and the other taking us to 10-year low prices. So first of all, we look at the general picture of the market. So as most people who've attended these before, I place a lot of importance on the structure of this market and the way it influences the dynamics. And the, the key factor is, of course, that we have highly centralized processing, Vietnam and India together, processed about 90%, just over 90% in 2020 of the world's cashews. We also have quite highly concentrated production of cashews. If you look in West Africa, 45% of the world's cashews grow in West Africa. About 11% in 
in East Africa, maybe a little bit less this season. So between Africa and India, you have most of the production in the world. The powerhouse of modern processing, Vietnam, and its, its near neighbors, particularly Cambodia, only produce about 18% of world production. And this is a key influence on the dynamics of the market, of course. It means that Vietnam is an importer of about 80%. It's probably more than 80% in 2021, we'll see, of its needs. And India imports about 55% of its RCA needs. So we've seen India in the last two years import more than 850,000 tonnes of cashew kernels. So we're approaching again record imports for India, partly because the crop is lower in 2020, but partly because demand was a bit more resilient than we would have expected if we go back 12 months ago and look at what we might think would happen during the pandemic. So the structure of the market is important to bear in mind when we talk about the key dynamics. So let's look at some of those dynamics. We've talked about the structure of the market, and let's have a look at how that relates to the calendar. So we have the harvest calendar, so each bar is a harvest, and the black one is the total availability in every, any given month. So this is an average, this is over a period of time, I think I did this over 10 years. The average percentage of the crop that would be available, and then we applied it to this year's projected harvest. So the black line you can see, the available RCN coming to market from the farmers peaks during April, and then it falls away. So we're now March, April, May, in a normal year, into peak production. But because of the structure of the market, these nuts are not available at those times. They have to get to market. They have to get to where they can be processed. And the red bars would be the arrival of those nuts at destinations. That means mainly in India or Vietnam for processing. And that, of course, pushes everything forward. So 55% of the crop is delayed. In other words, some of these nuts, by the time they get to be processed, are three months old. Others are six months, and even in some cases older than that. And that's within a current crop. So this is a key dynamic. 55% of the crop will be moved, will take an average of about 80 days to make it from the trees where it grows to the factories where it's processed. And that has, of course, got a huge influence on the way people look at the market. Second key dynamic, Vietnam. So as you know, Vietnam is a major importer of RCN, the largest processor in the world, by far the largest exporter in the world, the leader in technology, but actually not a very big grower of cashew nuts. Imports 80% of its needs. So every year in Vietnam, we have the following factors. First of all, buy their own crop. Vietnamese processors want to buy their own crop. It's about 20% of their processing needs. Secondly, they want to buy the Cambodian crop. On average, around about 12% of the total need, but increasing. So Cambodia this year will increase its production to about 250,000 tons. That could make Cambodia the fourth largest producer in the world in 2021. And obviously, because of the time it comes, which is right now in normal circumstances, it's very, very important for the huge processing industry in Vietnam. Processors in general have a short position on to lay by. If you're a reliable processor, you are selling forward to reliable customers, importers, and roasters who need to buy forward. We're going to talk about that later too. So you start the year in a short position. And technically, if we talk about Vietnam, it starts the year as a processing industry needing to buy about 2 million tons of raw cashew nuts. And as I've, I've said, some of that is domestic, some of it's Cambodian, most of it comes from West Africa. 
in Vietnam, we have a focus on price. So the factories are very price conscious and they have had a huge impact on the cost of processing. They've had a huge impact on the technology of processing, which in turn has impacted cost. But the focus generally would be more compared to their, their Indian competitors, be more on, on price. So their first port of call, because they have this domestic and Cambodian crop around them, would be to look for places where prices are competitive. And in the past, that's drawn them to Cote d'Ivoire, it's drawn them to Nigeria, and less to origins which would be higher price, higher quality, like Benin and Ghana, for example. They mostly rely on traders for their supply. So very few processors in Vietnam have an integrated supply chain, if any. We have seen the, the huge growth of TNT. We have seen that their figures suggesting they're going to trade about 600,000 tons, I think I saw in one article this year, whether that's from them or someone else estimating it, I do not know. But there is a consolidation in the, in the trade there. And one of the key things that needs to be borne in mind, generally processors and international traders of RCN don't trust each other. This is a key dynamic in the trade in RCN. There's a long history as we, we all know, any of us who've been in the business, there's a long history of tit and tat contract defaults, renegotiation, quality issues on arrival that didn't seem to be there at the time of load and vice versa. And this leads to a loss of trust. What's particular about 2021? First of all, it looks like this is a good crop, perhaps not as big as last year. But if we look at Ministry of Agriculture figures, if we look at Vina Cast's estimates and we talk to some people in the trade, it looks like it's, it's a good crop. There are some question marks about the timing of the Vietnamese crop. And from some people, there are some question marks about the size of the crop too, but I'm not placing too much importance on that right now. We do know that the Cambodian crop is going to be shorter than Cambodians had hoped for. Last year, Cambodia harvested about 230,000 tons. They would have expected to harvest maybe 260 to 70,000 tons of RCN this year, but they're currently forecasting about 250,000 tons. And they're saying the crop will be late. And that's, that's been front page news in Phnom Penh in recent weeks. And that is a factor, particularly for Vietnamese processors. In 2021, overall, the stocks of RCN entering the season are lower than in either of the past two years. That's largely down to the fact that the Tanzanian problem has been solved. And major Vietnamese traders bought the Tanzanian crop, brought it to Vietnam, brought it to India, and it's been, it's been processed. So stocks are lower than they were in either of the last two years. And I still think that there is a, an element of almost shock about the level of demand we experienced in 2020. So in 2020, we were talking together at this time last year on these ACA encounters, people were talking about the shock to demand, how demand will collapse in 2020, how the pandemic will destroy economies, how the pandemic will destroy demand for cashew nuts. Nothing could have been further from the truth. 2020 was an excellent year for roasters. It was an excellent year for process. And this has given a something of a shock to the market, I think. We're in a position in terms of demand where perhaps many people wouldn't have expected to be. And by the way, it's not just cashews, it's across the nut sector. It's been possibly with the exception of, of one or two nuts. Uh, I think maybe pistachios is an exception, but generally it's been a pretty good year for the consumption of nuts, even though the food service sector has been absolutely battered by the problems in the pandemic, particularly in the more developed countries. If we look at prices this year, RCN from the farm gate dried in Vietnam around $1,400 and in Cambodia, dried, it's actually exported without drying, 
but if we make a calculation for drying and shipping to the processors, it looks like it's something around 1300, 1350, maybe $1,400 a ton at the moment. Which given the timing and given the quality, and don't forget, we must take the quality into account anytime we talk about our CN prices. But given that, it seems to me that it's about par with what's available in Africa right now. So the key dynamic for Vietnam is processors need to buy somewhere about 2 million tons in the next five, six months. And many of them already have sales. And that might give you a clue as to why we saw this step down in price after the end of the Tet holiday. Somewhat illogical step down in price immediately after the Tet holiday. Let's have a look at the dynamic number three, India, the biggest market, the second biggest producer. India, again, of course, is a gigantic market, but India imports 55% of its RCN needs. I think it was eight, over 860,000 tons in 2020, quite remarkable. But India is very, very different to Vietnam. We, we can never put these two in the same category in terms of market structure and in terms of market behavior. So if we look at India, and we again, we look at every year, what happens in India every year in the cashew business. First priority is to buy their own crop processes, buy about 45% of their needs. High quality raw nuts, generally speaking, widely spread across the country nowadays, harvesting, March, actually it started in February, but let's say March to June for the bulk of the product. Market prices in India are higher than the world prices, much higher. 70, 75 cents per pound of 320s and sometimes more than that. The market is highly protected by import tariffs. So the Indian processing industry is not threatened by cashew nuts flowing in from Vietnam as it, as it once was. And they've tightened that a little bit over the years and they've increased the import duty and they've moved to ban things like the import of former kernels in an effort to develop and protect what is an important industry in India, processing of cashew nuts. And Indian consumers seem to be happy with that because they keep buying more of them. So if we look at how do processors work in India, generally because export is now quite limited, Indian exports have been falling, the, they don't have major forward sales. They may have some, but again, they'll be at quite high prices. Why do they have sales forward at high prices? Well, certain markets like Indian cashew kernels. Traditionally, markets in the Middle East, perhaps Japan is another that likes Indian cashew kernels for reasons of taste, color, quality, and tradition. Within the domestic market in India, most of the trade is, is much narrower window. Processors know that the, the buyers are coming. They know that this manufacturer is manufacturing a huge range of cashew products. And they know that consumers in markets are looking for holes, roasters, and so on across a wide spectrum. But generally, the business trades a little bit less forward. So you don't get contracts a year forward as you would in Europe or in the United States. You don't get retailers putting out annual tenders, for example. It's a spot and prompt market. And that makes a very different dynamic for Indian processors. Indian processors tend to focus on quality and suitability of the raw material. So this is why we will see early in the season, good focus from India on Benin for its taste and for its color, on Ghana for its, its size, its color, its processing characteristics, and later on Guinea-Bissau for high yielding, quite suitable for manual processing, raw cashew nuts. So in general terms, we have seen over the years, this has changed a little as Vietnam, Vietnam has grown, but in general, we see a concentration on higher quality origins, particularly early in the season. What's different in 2021? So firstly, we talk about the crop and it looks like the crop is 
a good forecast this year, something a little bit more than was originally forecast for last year. There are some concerns emerging. We see some conversation about the timing of the crop in some areas. Some states are definitely saying that their crop will be a little bit later. And if there's a timing issue, delayed crops often are smaller crops. We can't say that with any certainty, but past experience tells us that as crops get later, they're impacted by the weather and they may become a little bit smaller. Last year, processors had a, a really difficult year. They had a, a huge impact of the pandemic in India. It was an early lockdown, which particularly affected them. And they lost, I suppose you could say they lost maybe three months of consumption if we were to, to roll it all up. But actually consumption appears based on the disappearance of the crop, based on the imports, consumption appears to have been a little bit better than might have been expected. The Indian market for cashews is very resilient. And it looks, despite a difficult year, that it wasn't quite as bad as might have been expected, although processors did have a tough time. People are telling me that they expect the Indian demand to return to normal. Now, don't forget, normal in India is gigantic. This is a market of perhaps 300,000 tons of kernels. The next biggest market is the US, and that's at 165, 170,000 tons per annum. So the Indian market is gigantic. A return to normal growth in India means a lot, particularly if we look at the Indian trend in, in the crop, where we're not seeing growth in Indian production. Growth in Indian production on average over the last 10 years is less than 2%. We'll see where growth in consumption has been in a moment. So here we have a two contrasting processing markets. One, over 80% dependent on imports, 95% exporting the kernels that are produced. The other, about 50-50, 55% imports, 95, well not 95, but 85% of the kernels produced are actually consumed within the country. Vietnam works on forward contracting with international buyers, mainly to developed economies. India works on prompt delivery, even spot delivery, different handling of, of cash, different payment terms, different working capital needs, and has a market where brokens move as readily, at least up to 2020. It was slightly different in 2020, but where brokens move as easily as holes, maybe easier in some cases, and a market where prices are much higher. So two very different dynamics at play. Let's look at it from the, the buyer's point of view. We're talking about retailers, roasters, importers. First of all, we'll take a, a quick look at the trends in demand. So here's a, a global picture from those four big consuming countries, those regions rather. If we look at China, we see steady, we can almost call it steady, growth in demand up and down, Not still not a huge market, about half the size of the United States despite the population. In the last couple of years, you've seen quite a sharp increase. Now this may be partly because we get more access to the numbers in recent years, a better recording of the figures, particularly trade between Vietnam and China, may have exaggerated the increase. And perhaps there, maybe these figures are a bit lower than they should have been, but we don't know because we don't follow illegal or smuggled trade. Look at the EU market, very steady rise. It's This market has been on a rising trend as long as you care to go back. This chart goes back to 28. It starts just after the financial crisis. And ever since we've really seen growth and steady growth in the European market to the point where the European market is almost the same size as the US market. These are figures for the EU and the UK combined for consistency. If we look at the US, we see much slower growth. The US tends to go through growth spurts. We saw one early in the last decade, early in the decade before last. Um, 
and then it's been steady ever since. Average growth in the US market has been less than 2%, and in three of the last five years, there's been no growth at all. Last year, we saw pretty steady growth, and it looks as if there may be something happening similar to the EU. But I think we should be clear that most of the growth in the US market last year, and it was substantial, 7.8% growth in imports, most of that was down to the reaction to the pandemic. Whereas in Europe, I would say growth at 15% is not really pandemic related at all. That trend was there already. So let's have a look at, we're talking about dynamics. Let's have a look at how people view this, how they buy, what they think about it. And this, this is a big subject, but I'm just gonna go, just gonna touch it. So let's think about retailers. So we're talking about retailers now in modern retail countries. So modern retail countries would be North America, all of Europe, parts of, certainly large parts of East Asia, where basically the products are mostly sold through supermarkets. The retailer knows the customer wants cashew nuts. And in recent years, they know the customer wants more and more cashew nuts. And they need to make sure, but they're not interested in commodity risk. They like to buy forward. They like to match their purchases with what they think they will sell. And they like a little bit of flexibility in there, which can make life difficult for their suppliers at times. And they today look at the market and they think this cashew product is a very small product for us, but it's a very interesting product because it's growing. It has a very interesting profile and we have an opportunity perhaps to have a positive impact in that market. But we're nervous. We're nervous on a number of levels. Number one, we've seen prices extremely volatile in the past. Number two, we're concerned that this supply chain is not integrated, it's not managed, it's not traceable. And we have fears that some of the practices going on in factories are not clear. We don't know what they are. So therefore we're a little bit concerned and we hope there are no surprises. If we look at the roaster, increasingly the roaster, particularly if it's a, if it's a private label packer or a co-packer, the other guy's caught in between. They're caught in between the retailer and the supply chain. And they would say, I don't like risk either. Although I can't always get what I want. I can't always get today's price from a food safe, reliable supplier for the next 12 months. So I try to buy forward as much as I can from reliable suppliers, match my risk. My margins are tight. The idea that roasters make a, a killing is not true. Margins are tight, maybe better if you have a brand, certainly in terms of margin, but don't forget building a brand is a pretty expensive operation too. And finally, the importer. So the importer does like a little bit of risk. Margins for importers are tight too. They, they really have no choice. They have to take some risk. The suppliers are unreliable. And yeah, they do speculate. They do take positions from time to time. It depends on the company. Some are always long or short. Others wait for the opportunity. One thing's for certain, all of these people, the retailer, the roaster, the importer, and anyone else at that side of the chain, they like these prices. 320s at or below $3 a pound is an absolute bonanza. So they like these prices. What do they not like is volatility. What makes them nervous, and they're right, is the prospect of volatility. So they would like, if everything stayed nice and calm, don't tell anyone we like these prices. Maybe tell them that prices can come down further. Maybe tell them that every warehouse in the world is full of cashew kernels, which it isn't, by the way. Let's keep these things nice and stable. So when we look at this dynamic in February, when there is quite a lot of February and March, where there is quite a lot of focus on cashews amongst these groups, we need to look at the, the key factors that motivate them. So first of all, within this group, it's about 50% of world demand. 
So 50% of world demand is from markets that are modern retail, that would like, or they do, or would like to buy forward. We're talking North America, Europe East and West, part of the Middle Eastern market, much of the East Asian market, countries like Japan, Korea, and so on. So big question in a big dynamic at this time of year is how much has each of these bought or sold? What prices have they bought or sold? How confident are they that the demand they're projecting will happen? And how much risk are they taking? And this determines how they might react. So if they're confident in demand, if they haven't bought their full requirement, or if they've bought it at low prices, a change in the market trend, like we saw in 2017, will bring them all in. So importers who bought at a low price now realize, wait a minute, I'm not going to get some of these contracts. I need to buy them again. And that adds fuel to the, to the fire, adds air to the bubble. We saw that in 2017. So right now, what have we got? We've got a situation where the fastest growth in consumption is in the markets that are working on modern retail, supermarket distribution, in other words. How much have they bought or sold? Well, they have bought, but probably a little bit less than they would normally have bought. You'd expect the people would be a little bit more cautious in a situation of a global pandemic. Naturally, they would be. They also may have experienced a pretty good year last year, most of them in terms of volume. But the last, the last part of the year, particularly for the US, maybe wasn't as good as expected. And maybe that held them back a little bit. On the other hand, they may have brought material in in anticipation of, of difficulties with freight. But we certainly don't get the idea that they're overbought. We certainly don't get the idea that the warehouses are stuffed full of cashew kernels. That's not the case. It might be moving a bit slower, but this is not a, this is not a crisis. It's not a reason for kernels prices to come under pressure. At what prices have they bought? Well, we know that, that's the market. So they've bought somewhere long forward from top quality processors. They've bought somewhere between $3, $3.15. Importers taking their chances often buy from lower quality processors. Their cost price might be lower. But their risk will be higher. How confident are they in demand? Well, they're pretty confident. Anyone I talk to sees cashew demand, kernels demand is strong and likely to continue. You talk in India, they're hopeful of a better year in terms of demand this year. Europe, the United States, it's yes, it's related to the ebbing of the pandemic, but it's also related to underlying habits in purchasing. And if you look in cashew kernels, this in Europe especially, this increase in demand is nothing to do with the pandemic per se. These trends were there a long time before that. How much risk are they taking? Well, they're probably saying to themselves, if you're a retailer or a, or a roaster, you're probably saying, I'm, I'm not really taking that much risk. Given prices are so low, but given prices have just taken a, a knockdown. As Vietnamese brokers and traders came back after the Tet holiday. So they probably don't see it as a huge risk right now. And I think they're right about that. What they would see as a risk is if prices start to move up. And then we might see them come to market to try and lock in some of these prices. Others may decide that some of these prices are, are just too low and start to build some physical inventory. And some buyers have in recent years integrated their supply chains and they're now able to work in a different way. They're much more connected to the supply chain. They have an element of traceability. They have an element of access to farmers and a much closer relationship with the supply chain than the typical situation. Dynamic number five, unfortunately, poor market information systems. There's a lot of ways to describe this, but I thought I'd be diplomatic and call it poor market information systems. If you've been with us in previous weeks, you know we've talked about this aspect of the long journey of cashew kernels. We've talked about the difficulties in the supply chain, its complexity, the fact that it's 
counter the trends in general in food business, the lack of transparency, its vulnerability, and its opportunity, which is, of course, the double-edged sword, because there's an opportunity to integrate, there's an opportunity to build, but there's also an opportunity to speculate. So market information, or the lack of it, is very important. We have to look at it in the context of risk, and we've just been talking about buyers in the economically developed countries. What we have to say is all stakeholders are at risk, even if they've already bought or sold. There's so many problems of default in the market that everyone has something bought from someone who might default on them at some point, as usual. These poor market information systems mean that there's a, a gap. And this, this initiative by the African Cashew Alliance is an opportunity that they've taken to try and start a discussion about market information. And they've given me a chance to talk about how I see the market. And hopefully that will stimulate other people to do similar events and similar discussions to try and develop market information systems. The fact is, everyone in the cashew business talks their book. Everyone. It's like it's almost like a kind of a virus of its own. Why do they do that? They do it simply because they can. You know, into this vacuum of timely, accurate, detailed market information comes myth, misinformation, what we used to call talking your book. In other words, if you're if you've got a warehouse full of cashews, you tell everyone you think the market will go up. If you need to buy, you tell everyone you think the market will go down. And that's what's going on right now. There's people are talking the market up and down. And it's interesting because if the market were structured differently, if for example, and this is not gonna happen anytime soon, but let's say if for example, 100% of African cashews were processed in Africa, those processes would be linked to local farmers they would know what their local crop is. There would be market information systems locally. You would know what's going on. There would be a much higher level of trust in that value chain. There probably would be a hedging mechanism. It would be, look a little bit more like a cocoa, for example. So this is a key dynamic. The fact is that we, we sit here today and we don't have really good information on anything, even governments. Even governments tend to exaggerate their production and understate their weaknesses. Now that may be politics, sure. Governments everywhere do that kind of thing, but it doesn't help. It doesn't help their own farmers. It doesn't help their own processors. So making an unrealistic crop estimate actually can undermine the minimum prices you're trying to enforce. And this is very important. And knowing that there's not good market information out there means that a misstep in terms of information by a government anywhere in the world will be used by every other stakeholder to try and tell their own story, to develop their own way of seeing things. So when we look at the key dynamic of market information, we see that these early season, the myths, the misinformation, these are a major cause of problems in the West African cashew chain. They can cause farm gate prices, which are too low, which has a long-term impact because it doesn't stimulate further production, which is needed. It can cause export prices to be too high, which makes life difficult for processors. It can cause early harvesting, nuts being picked from trees rather than being allowed fall, for example. It can cause an overloading of the infrastructure, and we know that the infrastructure is under some pressure, particularly in West Africa. It can cause speculation, volatile prices, and at the end of the day, that will make banks reluctant to offer working capital products, particularly to processors, but also to exporters. So we're in a situation where, because we don't have a consolidated, accurate, timely market information system, Many businesses who are otherwise good businesses can't raise money.
because banks look at it and go, wait a minute, this guy's telling me the crop's huge. This guy's telling me the crop's small. This guy's telling me the price is $3. This guy's telling me it's two seventy-five. dollars Wait a minute, I'm just going to stand back from that. So we look at a situation in which we have a market where processors are short, they need to buy raw material. Traders have positions mostly, they have risk. Roasters have bought a lot, probably need to buy more. Naturally, low price purchases are at risk if the market were to go up, and high price sales are at risk if the market were to go down. And within that, we have only private market information services, self-serving culture of market information, everyone talks their book. A key dynamic, especially in West Africa, especially in February, March, and April every year. So when we look at these dynamics, we all know that markets are not always what they seem. We must consider these dynamics. We must consider the motivations resulting. I mean, the fact that you need to buy gives you a certain way of looking at the market. The fact that you don't have accurate market information gives you an opportunity to impose your motivation and vice versa. No one's perfect in this situation. But we must consider the market dynamics and especially the resulting motivations every time we read or hear a market report. I'm saying this loud and clear for our colleagues, traders, processors, members of ACA who are now engaged in buying RCN or selling RCN or processing. We really need to, do to be very careful. We really need to understand the whys and the hows and the structure of this market when we read a market report. So that's the dynamics. Let's have a look at a few numbers. We're going to talk a little bit about production and then about consumption. So these are based on my recent talk around the market. A look at the stats. I talk to a lot of people at this time of year to get some idea of where we're going. This is the way I'm seeing production. So what I do is I make an estimate of 2020, of course. We have figures for all of the other years. And then I look at the, the low estimates collected from a range of people and the high estimates collected from other people. And we try to make a, a distinction between the two. And you see this year, we have quite a, quite a gap, about 11% difference between the high and low estimates, which is unusually high. I've been doing this for about 10 years now, and I don't usually get that broader gap. I think part of that is because there maybe with some maybe some official bodies have been overly optimi optimistic even on their their forecasts. When I looked at it overall, I'm coming out with an increase in production in this year, uh, something like three three to four percent on 2020. In other words, a return to roughly where we were, uh, the, roughly the trend we were in up to 2019. Relatively slow growth in cashew growing around the world. It's about the average, the five year CAG or compound annual growth rate is about 3.14% to 2020. And if you take West African countries out of that elsewhere, it sinks below 2%. So in recent years, in the last five years, as you, well, as you can see on this chart, cashew production has not been growing particularly quickly. In contrast to earlier in the last decade, particularly when Cote d'Ivoire came online big time, you saw increases in a lot of West African countries at that time. We saw an increase in Tanzania to follow. That's basically going nowhere. And it's not weather events. I mean, you're not getting sort of four weather events in a row. It's simply that these new trees weren't planted, new trees aren't online yet. There is room for an increase in production. Just how much room we'll see when we talk about consumption. 
So let's look at the production in 2021 over some of the major region, regions. Vietnam, I've mentioned a little bit, um, looks like they've got a pretty accurate forecast. It's not as good as last year. The figure, there is some difference in the figures between different bodies in Vietnam, as we've heard recently. Look, India recovery this year is hoped for. Um, it was hoped for last year, but obviously that was a different situation. 2019 wasn't a good crop. Generally in India, the growth is quite slow. Now, in, India is obviously a huge country with a huge cashew growing area, huge cashew consumption. Growth has been slow, but there has at that time also been a transfer in where the cashews have been grown over the last 20 years. And if that settles, you might then start to see an increase in production. But for now, we're not seeing that. Ivory Coast, the world's largest producer, continues to grow. Very positive estimate this year. So we have a 900,000 ton estimate from the official sources this year, which is a pretty good crop, up from 848, I think, was the estimate of last year. Uh, trade sources a little bit more pessimistic, and there are a few questions around at the moment, which we'll talk about. West Africa as a whole, continued growth trend. The average growth in West Africa is around 3.5%. Um, again, quite a big gap between the, the low and the high estimates. Let's have a look at some of the, the major producers in West Africa. Cote d'Ivoire, world's largest producer of cashews. Again, very positive trend. It does appear that there is um, an underlying upward trend in Cote d'Ivoire. We are going to get to a stage soon where some of the trees we, you would expect would start to lose yield a little bit. Um, if we look at the, the share of West Africa, it's the main driver of production in West Africa. Very strong forecast from the government. Trade sources, a bit more conservative. I've heard people pick in numbers between 800 and 850,000. You've got to be careful though with trade sources because many of us would listen to people picking numbers and what they mean when they say 800,000 or 850,000 is not that they know that that's the number. What they mean is, I don't really think this 900,000 is, is true. What I see on the ground is not as big as I would expect. So this trade sources, you can give you a good idea, they can give you a good pointer, but they're not necessarily specifically accurate on, on the actual numbers. There is some concern on growing conditions that I've heard, I haven't been there lately, but I have heard that there's some concern as to the crop in the northern part of the country. Um, what I understand is material coming in in the, in the central areas is pretty good, in the east is pretty good, the north, further north you go, more concern, and of course this can have an impact on quality. Um, the crops come early, what about rainfall, how will that impact the harvest? This is always a question. Early start to the season, farm gate prices, pretty reasonable, probably workable for most people, I would have thought, around 305. This should work for processors, it should work for export. There are in some areas reports that prices are trading lower than that. I'm not sure I see any reason for that, um, other than perhaps maybe farmers are desperate to get some money in and the cash is slow to come into the system. That may be the case. Jute bags are being distributed. Looks like a good crop, but needs to be watched. If we look in Ghana, where the season is well underway, Ghana has been a country of pretty good progress. We see a wide variation in the low estimates, mainly trade estimates, and the government estimate. So I'm not so sure why this is, and I, I haven't been on the ground. The government estimate I heard was 100, 180,000 tons, which would be a, a gigantic crop. If we look, we see this difficulty. Ghana is a huge transit country for cashews. Cashews from the north, even cashews from the west, come into the country for shipment out through Tema, out through Takaradi. And 
as a transit country, it is difficult to estimate production. So Ghana, if you look at import figures at destinations in India and Vietnam, you'll find over sometimes over 250,000 tons registered as Ghana origin, but it's actually uh, origins, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Ghana, a whole range of countries. It's definitely an up and coming producer. Look for increases. If the official sources are right at 180,000 tons, that's really clicked this year. A regulatory body is being established. Expect Ghana to be a coming place for cashews in my mind. There is some buying activity in the country. There's even been some shipments. There are a range of different reports. I spoke to one fellow who's out in the country buying from farmers at the moment. And he was telling me that he was a little bit disappointed in the quality he was seeing. It was lower than normal. And um, he thinks that was down to some of the, the temperatures during the growing season. Whether or not that will, it hasn't affected prices or the quotes for exports so far. So that at least some of the product is coming in normal. But again, like Cote d'Ivoire, there's a question mark here as to what might be happening in Ghana. Risk trade, farm gate prices in Ghana are normally high. There's normally good interest. It's a good quality raw material in general terms. Prices start fairly high at the farm gate. It's quite volatile at the farm gate. Processors in Ghana have a, have a tough job. That's why we get such a, a low level of processing in Ghana. High farm gate prices, high competition early in the season. Good quality raw material, much in demand in India, for example where they like to fill the gap between the old crop and the new crop with something from Ghana and from Benin. If we look at Nigeria, again, I think remarkable progress in Nigeria on cashews. It happened probably because of the market more than anything else, I think, um, over the long term. But again, we see that production is relatively stable. Again, a good forecast this year. So Ghana is around about 250,000 tons at the, at the top end. And so I'm hearing 250, 225 to 250. And those people's opinions I'd respect are probably somewhere in between the two. So if we look at, at Nigeria, I think we should also bear in mind that the crop is determined not by a structured export situation. The crop is often determined by the prices. So the better the price, the more nuts will be gathered, the more nuts will make it to the market. If the port is disrupted, if prices are low in the country, just like in 2020, you can have a situation where the crop falls. It's just, it's just not collected. We expect a slow return to an upward trend in 2021. And I expect that will happen. A lot of the trees in Nigeria are quite old, but there have been projects to improve quality and improve varieties in some areas, and these have worked. Some of the quality on offer now from Nigeria is much better than you would have seen five years ago. It looks as if those projects are working very well, but on the other hand, a lot of the Nigerian cashew trees would be more than 30 years old, and we may see some fall away in production and yield from those and maybe they will eventually go out of production and because a lot of the trees aren't farmed as such they, they may be owned by someone but they're not farmed as such the chances to impact that sector are much less it's much more difficult but generally looks like a good crop this year keep a close eye for further impact of the pandemic which would impact on the crop processes in Nigeria. They really struggled in the COVID-19 in 2020. Um, I believe there was only something just over 5,000 tons processed. There are some good processes in Nigeria. They had a difficult time. Let's hope that they can return to some kind of normal business in the coming year. So summary for West Africa. I think official estimates may be a little bit overly optimistic. There's a wide difference between the official estimates and the trade estimates. Crop size definitely looks better than last year. There is a question mark on quality in some countries and maybe 
maybe we won't really know for three, four weeks where we're going on the West African crop. Production outlook for 2021. I see the RCN supply tight entering the year. In fact, it's the lowest stocks for some years. Small increase in production overall, maybe three to four percent, I think. Um, if those official forecasts were right, it would be more than that. Later crops in Asia, later crops in Cambodia, later crops in India, and possibly in Vietnam too. And this could influence the buying patterns, particularly if you're in Benin or Ghana, particularly if you're supplying Indian suppliers early in the season. Weather conditions still have a role to play. It's very early. Some crops are coming in early. That can be a blessing. It can be a great opportunity, but also it can be a problem, depending on the weather conditions. So it needs to be watched carefully. We've seen both. We've seen early crops turn into very good crops. More often, we've seen early crops peter out and be less than expected. As I said, a later Indian crop can bring more buyers to particularly Benin and Ghana early in the season. The Talking about price, and I don't always want to focus on price, we've mentioned it. The current RCN prices, they work with the farm gate prices, but they've limited upside. Um, as long as kernel prices are as low as they are, and, and maybe that's why they're as low as they are, there's a limited upside for RCN. Note of caution, in India, some states have recently shown a surge in cases of COVID-19. We need to be uh, keep a close eye on that. Let's hope that it's just a short-term thing. Otherwise, India seems to be getting back to business. Long-term, if we look at this situation, slowing production growth in Asia, slowing production growth in West Africa. Cashew production is not likely to keep up with cashew demand based on what we're seeing. So let's have a quick look then at demand and consumption. And the question here really is, we're trying to answer, are kernels prices, particularly following the recent fall, are they artificially low? And looking at demand in the, in the major regions, you can see it's been pretty positive in recent years. Some countries, India, had a problem last year due to the pandemic. Others, most of the Euro more European Union, had a very good year. And you can see sharp growth there in the European Union. Overall, pretty positive times for cashew consumption. If we try and translate that into a pattern, so here we have the percentage, average percentage growth, the compound annual growth rate by region for the five years, the five years to 2020, except in the case of India, because simply I felt including 2020 for India would distort the reality. So what we see in big markets, and here are our three big markets on the left-hand side, Europe, including the EU, EU including the UK, around about 7% growth. That is remarkable. India overall continues steady growth. India's growth has been a little bit volatile, but Steady growth around 4%. The US market, a very mature market, grows relatively slowly, below 2%. Question would be, will some of these trends that we've seen in Europe, healthy eating, less meat, more vegetables, will these impact US consumption of nuts? China, we've seen fast growth, partially down to better recording of the figures, but there is something going on in China on nuts, and it's not just cashew nuts. Middle Eastern market has been contracting. It's been contracting because of a major problem in 2020, but also it's a price sensitive market. And during 2017 and 2018, very high prices impacted the growth in demand. East Asia continues to grow slowly. East Asia would be Everywhere, New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia, Thailand, domestic consumption in, in Vietnam, Korea, Japan. So most of Eastern Asia, with the exception of China, which I record separately. And there we're seeing 
relatively slow growth rates. And what we've seen in the last year is a something of a shock. A lot of those countries like Indian cashew kernels, and they've had to change their patterns and go for Vietnamese. In Eastern Europe, finally, I, I mentioned it because it's high growth rate. This is not a big market. This is Eastern Europe outside of the European Union. So we're talking about Russia, we're talking about Belarus, we're talking about the Ukraine. And when we look there, we are seeing quite positive growth in demand, but it is from a very low level. Generally a positive picture in areas where we see slow growth, like the Middle East, we know why. In areas where we see steady growth, we know why. It's a mature market in the USA case and the EU. It's about food trends. It's about convenience. It's about snacking. It's about healthy food. You know, I like to do a little bit of uh, forecasting and I've been doing this forecasting since 2015. So as we come toward the end, I'll talk a little bit about what ha would happen if those trends continued. So based on what we've seen in the last five years, those growth rates I've just spoken about, consumption would start to look like this by 2027. So you get steady growth, continued growth, and eventually you start to see consumption approach about 5 million tons of RCM. If we look at production on the same basis, so again, five years, based on the last five years, what if that happened over the coming decade? That's what you get. So essentially, the conclusion is that consumption is growing faster than production. And that's been a factor, that's been a factor since 2015. It looks set to continue to be a factor. The room for an increase in production is definitely there, but the efforts to increase production don't seem to have worked at the same speed as they did in the, the certainly the decade before last and the first half of the last decade. So this, I don't know, this could be good news. It's certainly good news for consumption, but it also could be bad news in that it might stimulate volatility on prices. And what is supposed to happen in markets is that prices are supposed to correct imbalances. That's apparently how markets work. Uh, not necessarily the cashew market though. Uh, if we look at it today, we have a market where there is question mark over supply, where demand is expected to continue very strong, and yet cashew kernels are at the lowest prices that we've seen for, well, the lowest prices that we've seen certainly since the last decade, the start of the last decade. So we're looking here at a market that if I strictly on the basis of what we see answer the question, are cashew kernel prices artificially low? The answer would have to be yes, they are. Does that mean they can go lower? It could, but I think that the downside is very limited at this point. So be careful what you listen to in terms of uh, reports, in terms of sources of information and in how we might judge the next steps in the market. And let's not get our long-term trends mixed up with our short-term trends. The dynamics, the sentiment has a big impact on the short term. These fundamentals tend to have an impact in the longer term. So as we look at our market and make our decisions, we need to bear that in mind. We can't ignore COVID and the impact is generally easing now. Vietnam continues with low cases. India, as I mentioned, there's some cases surging. India felt they had it, it beaten, but some surging again, let's hope that that is, is only a short-term phenomenon. In West Africa, as in India, indeed, some vaccinations have started and it remains a, a relatively light impact. Um, uh, if, you, if you caught it or if someone you know caught it, that doesn't sound like a light impact, but statistically, it's, it's a relatively light impact. China, business as usual, some outbreaks which they deal with very promptly. In Europe, one of the most affected areas the vaccination programs are ongoing. Um, most countries have started their vaccination programs. Some are further ahead than others. The restrictions are lifting slowly. It doesn't seem to be affecting the 
uh, retail or the snack food business, it does still have an impact on the food service sector, which will impact cashew pieces to a certain extent, but not, not the way it might other nuts like hazelnuts, for example, or walnuts. The United States obviously heavily impacted. Cases are now falling in the United States. Vaccination has started. So it does appear that by the middle of the year, that the impact of COVID-19 in terms of its disruption to society will abet. We don't know how deep the economic impact will be. We do know there will be some. We do also know that many economists forecast a, a post-pandemic boom, so long as interest rates can be kept under control. Um, but there is a concern, you'll, you'll read it in your newspapers, about new variants of the disease, which need to be kept a close eye on. Key things for us in the cashew business right now is that demand, North America, Europe stays in line, that India continues to process and Indian demand returns to normal, and that the low cases in Vietnam so that they can continue to process as they have been are maintained. So a little bit of an overview as we come towards the close. Tight balance this year. I can't see any particular over or under supply in the short term. Longer term is a different matter. Vietnam and Cambodia set the scene. This is the key dynamic at this time of year. How will Vietnamese processors and traders react to what they see locally? In 2017, we saw a tight situation in Vietnam, a poor crop in Vietnam, lit the fuse for an incredible rise in prices. So the scene is set Vietnam, in Vietnam, but they're also looking closely at Cambodia. Production up by three to four percent in my view at the moment. Caution on the weather in West Africa, it can still have an impact. I think the kernels market is fundamentally undervalued. That's not a recommendation to buy or speculate, by the way, that's just an opinion. Um, it can be undervalued for years. It can be undervalued for minutes, who knows? But it does look as if it's undervalued at the moment. I think if you had a choice, would you like to own cashews at $2.85 FOB five years from now? You'd be saying, yes, I would. I think the RCN upside is limited. It's limited by the kernels market. And it's obviously limited by the fact that a big crop is coming in right now. Um, you, I don't think you'll see speculation in RCN. I don't think you will see early entry to the market. I don't think you will see too much money taste chasing too few nuts uh, in, the, in the next three, four weeks for sure. Of course, I could be wrong. There are a few factors that I would consider outliers, strategic factors that we need to just bear in mind First of all, the low level of prices, as I've mentioned. Secondly, the significant sales and short positions. So if we did see a turn in the market, people in those positions would react. That's a key dynamic of this time of year. The late crops are exposed, so we need to keep an eye on the weather in the producing countries. Consumer demand growth, so this, is, this is a key factor. Consumer demand growth is not based on prices. Consumer demand is not growing simply because cashew prices are low. Consumer demand is growing for other reasons, and that won't change. So if this, this could march on regardless, regardless of any increase in price, regardless of availability, Consumers are buying cashews for other reasons. It's never been cheap. It's never been cheap to buy cashews. So the price is not the primary factor. And what they read online about them, these are really important factors driving demand. Low opening stocks, that's a factor. The problem in Tanzania was solved last year. So we've lower levels of opening stocks due to huge demand in 2020. The consolidation in RCN trade, I'm not sure what this means, but I know it means something and that could be positive, it could be negative. The emergence of, in the last few years, of a new gigantic trading partner 
in Vietnam for RCN. Uh, changes the dynamic in the market and that needs to be watched. We've seen some of the biggest deals ever done, done in the last two years. Within this, there are the enough ingredients, strong demand, low prices, late crops, significant short positions. There are the ingredients for a price boom if something were to go wrong. It will only happen if something goes wrong in terms of production. As the strategic outliers, that means these are the, the low chance, these are the outsiders in the race. These are the teams that are not likely to be lifting, lifting the cup anytime soon. So thank you very much indeed. It's always a pleasure to talk about cashews and I, we'll be back on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day here in Ireland. And then we'll be talking about African cashews and sustainability. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jim. It's also always a pleasure to hear you talk about cashews. Uh, at this point, we move into the Q&A section. And uh, please, you can use the raise hand feature uh, if you want to uh, speak out your question or uh, also type it in the uh, Q&A uh, portion. Uh, we also uh, have already a, a couple of questions for you, Jim. Uh, the first, which I saw from Wayne. Uh, Wayne, uh, would you want to uh, speak to your question? It is, uh, I would like to know where Jim is getting the RCN price of $1,400. Where is he getting this information? But I think let's pay it a bit higher. Uh, uh, on the sources of the data that we use and uh, also um, how all this is triangulated in a way that uh, they can be relied on by the uh, industry actors. So Wayne, are you there? Would you like to, uh, please uh, let's have Wayne's uh, video audio active and then uh, for us to uh, know. But, but, but Jim, you can, you can already start talking about uh, how we gather data as an institution, ACA, uh, you have been involved a bit, and then also how we triangulate all the data that is coming uh, in this kind of uh, presentations. I think that is more playing it on a higher level. Uh, data, I think Wayne was asking specifically about the farm gate data. Yeah, exactly. So I have co-ops and local buyers in Vietnam that I talk to. I have um, a network in Cambodia that I talk to. And so what we do is we track the farm gate prices that they're seeing and they're paying themselves. And then we obviously factor in the drying and the movement to market, uh, applied the current exchange rate. And that's where, you, that's where you get the prices on average. Obviously you can't cover all areas, all prices, but that's roughly where it comes out based on the information early season information, naturally enough, in Vietnam. And then you can cross check that with a uh, traders and they will give you some information. In African countries, farm gate prices are collected by the African Cash Alliance. You'll see them every week in the splits. And the African Cash Alliance has a group of professional analysts in each country that collects the farm gate information. By ringing around, co-ops, farmer groups, traders, local markets, and exporters, and coming to a conclusion on the, the average price. Obviously, we can't give regional prices in a limited form like this, but that, that's basically how we gather farm gate prices. It, it, by the way, uh, that network takes years to develop. So it's unfortunately not something you can turn on and turn off. And the other issue with it is, as I'd love to turn that into a, a timely, up to the minute database style of market information in Asia. But unfortunately, I, I do a lot of work in Cambodia. I've done a lot of work in Vietnam in the past. Unfortunately, people are they're just not willing to put their, their information out publicly. And you can understand that it's a very competitive environment. Uh, thank you, Jim. I, I still would like to exhaust some of the questions that are here. 
uh, about consumption in Africa, I know it has not been growing the way it should. Uh, what is not being done right here when you talk about, uh, we talk about consumption in Africa, more or less for somebody uh, who is outside the continent, but dealing a lot in, uh, what do you see as uh, some of the reasons why consumption hasn't grown in the, uh, on the continent? Yeah. Well, I think that obviously there are a number of factors. I mean, the first and most obvious factor is there's no real tradition of consuming cashew nut kernels in most African countries. Um, that's a fact. Now, that needs to be addressed, and we've seen efforts by some governments at Sieta there in Abidjan, those events, to try to do a lot to publicize the opportunity for consumers to eat cashew nuts. The second reason is that the, the format in which the product is presented. So if you present a product in a, a difficult to access format, either difficult because of its price, difficult because of the packaging size, difficult for reasons of flavors or tastes, then it, it becomes, it is quite difficult to stimulate widespread consumption. I think that there has been in general in cashews worldwide until quite recently, there's been very little done to promote consumption. If we look at opportunities, there's definitely opportunities in countries which have urban areas, countries which have a middle class. So if we look at cities, if we think West Africa, if we look at Lagos, if we look at Abidjan, if we look at Accra, you would have thought there would be opportunities. And certainly take Accra as an example. There's plenty of food processing businesses in Accra. We look at developments in beverages in Ghana, the production of beverages and marketing locally. They can give us good templates for the development of, of snack foods. But there is a long way to go. Um, and I think that I was talking recently to a processor in Benin. I'm, I'm, Tolaro Global, I'm sure they won't mind me mentioning their name. Um, and they're looking at ways to promote local consumption by preparing the product in a way that suits local consumers. And I think one of the reasons is that for a long time, processors have looked outside Africa and they haven't really understood how there's an option. So what needs is to develop this option for local consumption is to look at what way do people in Africa, and you can't even say Africa because it's such a gigantic continent, so you have to look more regionally, what way do people want to consume cashews? Maybe it's cashew products. So maybe it's a cashew butter, maybe it's a cashew flour. And these are products which utilize brokens, which generally speaking, in recent years, we've had trouble marketing. So how well is it growing? It's growing very slowly. Is it growing? Yes, it is. Um, the future for that, in my opinion, depends on how well it's promoted and the format that it's presented. I'm not sure that presenting roasted 320s to local consumers in many African countries is the way to go forward. There may be better ways to present this product, more attractive ways that fit better with their current snacking habits. But there's obviously a segment of the market, you know, like, like it would have been in the US market 20, 30, 40 years ago, where cashews were only eaten by people with a lot of money. It was a luxury product. It was a status product. That's changed. And they're consumed by the general consumers now. Um, and a lot of that was about package size, price, the format it's presented in, and developing different products. So there's a lot of work to be done but marketing has not been a strong point. And I think that's one of the reasons for slow growth in consumption. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. There's a question I want to know. Uh, in your opinion, what can uh, you advise for African processes in this current time when suddenly the kernel prices have declined? Uh, this is Lucia uh, with this question. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question, Lucia. I think, um, first of all, hold your nerve. I think that there is an element of market manipulation going on at the moment. I think that we've seen 
we've seen a couple of things going on. We've seen major buyers are more interested to buy in Africa. I know that from personal experience. We've seen those buyers understanding that they may have to pay a higher price to for that extended supply chain. I think processes need to highlight their strengths, fast delivery of, if you're in West Africa, fast delivery of the product to markets in Europe or North America. I think they need to highlight their strengths and traceability. I think in some countries, Benin, for example, they need to highlight their strengths in product quality, color and taste, for example. Um, that would apply also in other countries. I think processors need to um, avoid a, a speculative mindset because it could be that kernels prices are lower in order to keep RCN prices lower. And if you wait too long to buy your RCN, the whole thing will just roll up against you and you'll find yourself in a situation as to a certain extent happened last year where you had a what looked like a super buying opportunity for RCN and would have been a super buying opportunity uh, for RCN, but many people missed because they were they were put off by early season price calculations. Make no mistake, the current kernel kernel prices they don't make money for processors in Vietnam either. These prices mentioned two eighty five for three twenties and so on. At current prices in Vietnam, at current prices in Africa for RCN, these do not make money. So you need to watch this carefully. You need to identify, and that's one of the reasons we talked about the dynamics and sentiment this morning. Keep a close eye on it. But I, I think that, for, to my mind, I would enter this season with the view that there is an opportunity here. I would put a lot of effort into marketing. Personally, my clients are seeing good buying interest, particularly from European buyers, and they're seeing that interest at prices that, that work. And I think that's going to grow. Don't be tempted to speculate though. There, this is a very you know, difficult dynamic that we're dealing with. Um, try and find the buyers that will support you to process and to sell at least part of your product. Don't neglect marketing. I think it's one of the things that has been unfortunately neglected too much in recent years by African processors. They focused on development. I mean, I know it's not an easy task, but they focused on the process. They focused on the development of the business, even on the supply chain, but they forget about marketing and they end up marketing to the wrong level. So if you're a, a quality processor with certification, you should be marketing further down the value chain than to selling to some other one, someone else to export or maybe selling to an importer. And you should you know, be nailing this myth that African kernels should be lower in price. African kernels should not be lower in price. African kernels should be produced to the right quality with food safety. In those conditions, they're actually worth more money to buyers in, in developed markets in Europe and the United States. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Mamadou Diaby from Agibex is asking what I uh, also tell the perennial question, uh, why Africa is exporting uh, a lot in, uh, in terms of raw cashew nuts instead of uh, processing. And then secondly, why very little is said about Guinea Conakry and I believe also about Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Senegal uh, uh, region. So if you can put it all together. So Africa is exporting RCN simply because it produces far more RCN than it can process. That's pretty obvious. Um, and the reason for that is the lack of investment in processing over the years. And that's for a lot of different reasons. Um, I would focus on the perception of risk. So investors, business people, and banks look at the cashew sector, particularly in certain countries, and they say, that's not for us. We see that as too risky. We will support trading of RCN, but we won't support the establishment of processing facilities. Um, and if, if you look in, you can understand that. I mean, you can understand why someone would 
be reluctant to build a processing plant, which is a long-term investment, which takes years to get a, a return on in a country that they thought might be unstable or unlikely to offer a return. What has happened now is that the, the supply of raw nuts has improved. The technology has improved so that now it's a little bit more straightforward, although more expensive in terms of investment, it's a little bit more straightforward to build a factory. You can predict much more easily how a machine will behave than to go out as it would have been at one time and try and you know, recruit five or 6,000 workers that you need at the factory every day. Um, if you can bring that down to, you know, today you can run a 10,000 ton processing plant on maybe 550, 600 people. Um, and that's a much easier management challenge and much more predictable management challenge. Unfortunately, it means that the sector will create fewer jobs in individual factories, but hopefully it means in the broad level, it'll create much, much more. Um, I, I think that if I look at Senegal, the Gambia, um, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry as processing areas, as areas for investment, we're not seeing huge investment recently. We've seen some in Guinea, We've seen in Guinea-Bissau, there are some factories now operating, relatively small factories, but I, I think they have good potential. And in Senegal, not too much. There is local processing, but not too much in the way of factories. And I think that's down to the fact that it's hard to compete with investment opportunities in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, for example, at the moment. It's difficult to compete with um, the reputation for business in Ghana it's difficult to find domestic companies to partner with. And there are, you know, and there's reputational difficulties. Guinea-Bissau has a reputational difficulty that discourages investors. Um, on the other hand, we do see processing growing steadily. I won't say, I won't say rapidly, but steadily um, further east. So unfortunately, in one sense, this is gonna be with us for some time. Processing is going to develop fairly rapidly, I think, now. And I wouldn't be surprised if Nigeria, Benin, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire made really strong strides forward. But I think it'll take a little bit longer in the countries further west. Um, we should add Burkina. Burkina has had processing investment for many years and does seem to be doing, doing quite well in that respect, too. Um, you know, this is a tough business. It's very volatile. You need to take a long-term view of it. You need to choose your technology very carefully. You need to place emphasis on partnerships with buyers, which is, is unfortunately not done by many. Um, you need to think about what kind of a buyer you're selling to, whether it's one that will work with you, that will show loyalty, that will stay with you over the years, or one that's simply interested in getting a, a competitive price and will switch to someone else if the price is lower. So it's, it's there, there is a certain amount of light at the end of the tunnel, but I do think that the countries in the Western part of the region from Guinea, let's say from Conakry up as far as Dakar, those countries will need a lot of support to get their processing industry going, despite the fact that they tend to have very good quality raw cashew nuts. Uh, thank you, Jim. There's also Florian. Uh, his question is, how did it work in Vietnam to create processing plants? Did it come by international investments and maybe to play it also uh, additionally? Is there any blueprint in your mind in terms of how they've gone about it and the lessons for Africa? But there, are, there are definitely lessons for Africa. It is good to look back and let's, let's put this into perspective. When I first went to Vietnam on cashew business in 1991, it was exporting the vast majority of its crop to India for processing. At that time, there were a few processing plants, but not many. Within the following five years, some processing plants started to come up. It was based on, I think, key, the key things for me were a good entrepreneurial approach, good support from the government. And remember that the political system in Vietnam is very different to the political system in most West African countries. It was more than anything, in my opinion, it is the linking of processing to the technology, the processing linking to the local technical institutes, 
So I remember going into a factory in 1993. We tried to buy a factory in Vietnam in 1993. We didn't buy it, but we tried to buy it, the company I was working for at the time. And I went in and I went through this factory and there wasn't a, a stone left unturned. Well, what I noticed was that there was, even at that time, innovative machines, people from local technical institutes, engineers and designers were in the factory operating, viewing how the process worked, working on the machines. I saw um, technology from all over, really. I saw Russian technology there. It wasn't great. It was packaging technology. It wasn't great, but it showed an attitude to processing that we want to develop this process. We want to improve it. And for me, that was a key thing. But there were also government supports to develop the supply chain um, financing. At that time, and from then until late in the first decade of this century, there was very little external investment. There has been some more external investment in recent years. We know that um, there was an in Indian investment. We know that there's Olam has invested. We know that Intersnack has invested. We know that some trading companies have invested too. Um, so it has changed somewhat. Um, but the basic foundation was domestic. Good government supports, good care of the supply chain, good marketing. So Vietnam went from selling raw cashew nuts in 1992, almost exclusively, to the largest exporter of kernels in the world in 2008. That is a fabulous achievement and it continues to grow. Now, whether or not growth at this current level is sustainable is another matter, but what's happened in the past is quite remarkable. And I, I think that those are, those are the areas. Access to capital, linkage to technology, good marketing, and good management. Those, those were the four things that it's built on. Um, it was not built on the idea of you know, someday someone will come with a big check and build us a processing industry. That won't happen. Someone could come along with a big check for a processing industry if they already see something happening. But if there's nothing happening, it, it's unlikely to bring in the investment. Having said that, let's look at a, a good example. Let's look at Cote d'Ivoire. Fairly good supportive policies for processors by way of subsidy. The access to the technology, the general support of the government, um, some realistic price setting mechanisms. This all seems to be stimulating a growth in processing. And let's recognize that processing in African countries is growing. It's stop start, it's spotty, it's faster in some places than in others, but it is growing. And increasingly there is an engagement by buyers in that process. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I, related to your um, last intervention and maybe the previous one, uh, Andre Nanke uh, is asking, particularly Guinea-Bissau, uh, how what needs to be done to attract uh, more investors. Is there any peculiarity for a, a region or, let's say, a country of that nature? And uh, any quick advice you can give on that? I think Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau's need is, is great, um, the country being so highly dependent on cashew nuts, therefore the opportunity. So what I would suggest, or what I would, or what I would like to see is incentives, they need to be financed from outside the country because I don't think that the, the national exchequer would be able to sustain that. Incentives for processors to invest, support, technical support for them to build their products, a, we know that the raw cashew nuts are high yielding and much sought after by processors in, in India in particular, but also in Vietnam. And that, those factors need to be highlighted. I mean, I don't see, I, I could be wrong, but I don't see people, institutions, the government going out and promoting the opportunity for cashew investment in Guinea-Bissau. 
I'd like to see that. And I, I think the, the key thing is, it, it's pretty clear right now that it's not just simply on the basis of return on investment that would make Guinea-Bissau attractive, but the combination of return on investment and the idea of a, a major social impact in, the, in a country that is in need, um, that could be quite a, a potent, attractive mix if it's well presented. Uh, thank you, Jim. Let, let me go to um, a couple of questions that are directly linked also to your presentation. Uh, you have mentioned uh, five key dynamics, structure of the market, uh, which uh, private sector, and more importantly, development partners are beginning to work on. Uh, but then again, you talked about Vietnam, India, retailers, roasters, and others, and also poor MIS. But missing in these five key dynamics, uh, for me, are the influence of producers and uh, processors, especially the African producer and processor. And my question is, are they losing grounds or have become a more predictable and stable factor in the market, such that they are not, for you, then a key dynamic uh, looking at 2021? Well, uh, what, what I'm speaking about today is the key dynamics in the early season. Okay. Yeah. So this is very specifically about what influences, what are the key dynamics that influence the market at this time of year? What creates the sentiment? What creates the market psychology in this period, February, March, early April? <clears throat> Obviously, farmers, producers are the key dynamic. Without them, there's no cashews. So they are the key dynamic if you take it in a much broader perspective. Yes, the, I think it's true what you say, Ernest, that they, they have not got the influence that they should have. They, I guess, they suffer from a lack of good, relevant market information. The technical assistance from a lot of organizations, not least ComCashew, is, is tremendous. You look at ComCashew, TechnoServe, um, ProCashew, there's so many projects that give very good technical assistance to farmers. But at the same time, without um, organization, it's very difficult for farmers to represent their point of view. And perhaps they get a chance at, at an election, but it's very difficult to, to galvanize that. Have farmers done well? Well, I suppose on paper, you look at it and you think farm gate prices have increased a lot. I mean, if we go back to 2004, 2003, farm gate prices are over $150, $200 a ton. Um, look at them today. Yes, they certainly have improved. Um, on farm yields have improved. So people who grow cash should be making a better return on their labor and on their investment now than ever before. Do they have influence in the market other than the influence that they may have on governments um, to, to help set or to guide regulatory policy, um, they really don't. And that's because this is such a, if you look at our, our uh, supply chain or value chain, whichever term you prefer, if you look at it, it's highly segmented. It's got many, many different layers in it. And within that, you don't have, in general, a large cooperative structure or a large farmer organization structure that can have influence. So this leads to the phenomenon where, generally speaking, in terms of price, farmers take what's offered um, rather than helping to set prices, although they do get some assistance from governments nowadays. Um, farmers are, what they are is they're a key dynamic without a voice. That's the way I would put it right now. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I, I will stay with the production and uh, on the cash production 2021. Uh, here you talked about three to 4% uh, increase uh, over 2020 uh, figures. But then the, the, my question is what accounts for such a forecast? Uh, indeed, what has changed significantly in just a year, especially with the age of the trees in West Africa and the climate issues resulting in delays that you mentioned. So why such uh, an optimistic uh, growth projection, I would say? Well, it's, it's actually not so optimistic in the sense that it's a return to what we would have seen prior to 2020. Um, so what we're seeing this year is 
we're seeing increases a return in India, which is a major factor in this forecast. The an improved crop in Cote d'Ivoire, which is a major factor in this forecast. Um, and we're seeing a better crop, slightly better crop in Cambodia. Um, and these are the factors. You take all of those things, you put them together, and you come up with something just, just over 3% by calculation. Um, I would also expect a better crop in Benin, small, but better crop in Benin and in Nigeria. Um, the, the other side of the range, the higher end, is based on some of the official forecasts, which, as I said in the discussion, are probably a little bit over-optimistic for my taste. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't think if we look at the production situation, we're talking about an overly optimistic increase. I think what we're looking at is more or less a return to where we were before the pandemic. Um, let me see if I can put uh, some of this up. So if, if we look at, let me get the right slide out. So if we look at this, current low estimate is basically on par with 2019. Current high estimate, and I'm, I'm a little bit questioning the high estimate. And what I'm saying is that the reality is somewhere in between the two. And maybe we will see a, a figure here somewhere as, as I'm pointing out on the screen in between the low and the high estimates. Now, that is still to be shown to be true. That's an estimate done in the last days of February when harvest had only barely started. As we know, we can see some volatile weather conditions and that there, there are, as I said in my strategic outliers, there are the ingredients for some disappointment on the crop estimate out there. You might recall the last time we, we had our GME, we talked about um, La Nina being an outsider. And that too could have an influence. And that too could be behind some of the delays in the harvest. So I, I'm, I'm saying 3%. I'm suggesting a caution. Um, yeah, maybe it is optimistic, but I don't think it's overly optimistic. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, staying on the, this particular slide and then uh, another statement you made here, you talked about RC and upside being limited by the kennels and here, more importantly, kennel prices. And then you also talked about the fact that consumption is going faster uh, than demand and that uh, normally would have expected that prices will correct the imbalance. But this yeah. is not in, in, in the cash flow market. So on the backdrop of these two uh, statements, uh, I want to find out whether it is a good strategy to promote or to drive the growth of production in Africa in the next 10 years. I, I know there are a lot of uh, development partners. Uh, the USDA is also implementing their project uh, focusing on production and uh, other areas. So the question is, is it really uh, something that we should do and what potentially it can do in terms of impact on uh, uh, farm gate prices. Yeah, I mean, it looks to me as if there is room for increased production um, over the next 10 years or so. Um, there is a, you know, there is a danger that shortages would cause prices to be very volatile, which would slow the growth in demand. But on what we know today, I, I wouldn't be at all concerned that there would be nowhere to go with the products. What does concern me though, is that projects that increase production, that they need to focus too on, on the market. In other words, that increasing production alone will only cause a strain on the infrastructure that manages the export of the RCN. And, and that would be, you know, if we look at the, the projection, and look, let me highlight, this is a projection, right? This, this, is, this, is, not, this is not gospel. So let's be, let's be clear about that. Um, but if, if we look at this, and if you were to stimulate production to meet the projected demand in that example, you would need to see production, you know, heading up toward four and a half million tons, which means 
you know, almost a million tons more than we have today. Now, how is that million tons going to be managed? It is going to probably be in West Africa, assuming the trends elsewhere don't change, and there's no sign that they are changing. So let's say we have more production, another million tons in West Africa. Are we going to need the trucks, warehouses, ports, containers, ships to ship that million tons to Asia to process it? Not to mention the carbon footprint of that trade. So on that basis, that would mean that the RCN trade would go from about 2.3 million tons to about 3.3 million tons. I don't see that as, as sensible or feasible. Therefore, projects that concentrate on increasing production, which is a good idea, might also consider how that integrates with creating the, the local processing opportunity for that production to prosper. And that would be more or less in line with what buyers are asking them to do. Buyers want traceability, they want integrated supply chains, they want alternatives. That's not to say buyers are no more interested in buying 80% of their cashews from West Africa than they are in buying 80% of their cashews from Vietnam. What they would like is to be able to buy some in Vietnam, maybe some in India, some in West Africa, some in East Africa, and some in Brazil. That's what buyers look for. Um, for me, I think the infrastructure will struggle if production is continually cranked up without RCN post-harvest infrastructure and processing infrastructure. And that means creating processing plants, creating African brands, adding value, developing an industry rather than just a production. I don't think that there is a risk on what I see. I don't think there is a risk that we will get a situation as has been seen in some crops, particularly in East Africa, where production was ramped up and then there was nowhere to go with it. I don't think that will arise. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I don't see any uh, additional questions uh, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A. So, and then also looking at the time, I will, uh, at this point, uh, invite you, uh, Jim, to give us your final words and also what to expect in the next fortnight uh, when we come uh, the way of participants again. Yeah. Well, um, I would say my closing remarks on this is be, be careful what you believe in when it comes to cashews. Be careful who you listen to. Um, or look for the motivation. If you're a processor, if you're a grower, if you're an exporter, if you're supporting the industry, if you're a trader, look for the motivation of the information that you're receiving and, and take care with that. Make your own mind up. Use independent sources where they're available. In two weeks, on the 17th of March, we're going to, to celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. We're going to talk about African cashews and sustainability. So I'm hoping that we will talk about the position of the African cashew sector in sustaining the industry as a whole in terms of these issues that we've mentioned today, traceability, local processing, organic production, quality improvement, and also the role that the African cashew sector can play in re improving the quality and reducing the carbon footprint of the cashew sector. I'm looking forward to it. This will be a little bit more, a um, little bit less short-term market orientated than the first two sessions, and a little bit more looking at the, the long-term prospects for the African cashew sector. Thank you very much, Jim. As always, it's been a pleasure having you. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, in the next two weeks uh, and to follow up on the uh, topic you have uh, discussed with us. We also thank very much our cherished uh, participants who have been with us, as well as our sponsors. Uh, we will be leaving the network on for the next uh, 20 minutes so that we can uh, uh, you know, give you the opportunity to network among yourselves. Uh, ECA is about networking, it's also about knowledge sharing. And uh, we expect that you are learning a lot from this. You can also reach us with the potential issues that you want us to address on these forums. 
and uh, to make sure that we are coming your way in uh, away with the kind of knowledge that you need to let your businesses grow. Our mandate is to grow the learning in the industry, is to grow the businesses, and is to help you take informed decisions. On that note, thank you very much, and see you again next two weeks.